fund or the meeting of the Montpelier, Montpelier Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors um, at 6:39. Um, so, first order of business: public comment. Any any public comment? Yep. Great. Uh, consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Yeah. I'll second. Second. Can I make a, Can we pull the minutes off, please? Um, I can amend the motion to uh, approve the consent agenda minus the minutes. Need a second. The minutes of July twenty fourth. I'll second the amendment. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Do um, you want to talk about? I did. I just. We didn't have Jerry anywhere on the minutes. Um, she was there as an audience member, and okay. she did get invited into executive like, session later. Was, yeah, she was pseudo part of that meeting, so I felt like she should have been listed as a audience member slash appointee at some point. That was all. Everything else was on here. She's she's on there as a board member. Well, she was. She's on, She wasn't sworn in, was she? Yeah. Name spelled wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you're right. It was listed yeah. as. The board to correct that too. Have you since been sworn in? Mm -hmm. Oh, I went to the The Tammy wasn't there, and the other person had no idea what she was talking about. So I'll have to go back. Okay. Yeah, so you won't be able to vote on anything. Right. Right. So it's still. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I will have yeah. to. Kick our clerk appointment down the road then too. Do we have a quorum then? Yes. One, two, two three, three, four. four. We need five. We have five. Okay. We don't have to go drag Michelle out of the service. <laughs> oh, but she just needs her. Should we need her? Uh, <laughs> Michelle. Yeah. If the show must go on. If the show must go on. Uh, okay, so we will. Uh, so to be clear, the amendment to the minutes is to move Jerry from being president of the board member to president of the yes, and reflected as invited into the executive session. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks for catching that. So we need now a motion to approve the minutes as amended. And the amendments are to move Gary Hawk. From a board member to, um, I think, just three more from a board member, and then note that she was invited as a board pending board, board member to. into the executive session. Okay. And to spell her name right. Yes. <laughs> Throughout. Uh, I'll make a motion with those amendments. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. So, learning focus and um, have Ryan Herity, uh, UAS principal, and Marilyn Dean, the director of student services, uh, to talk about co teaching within a multi tiered system of support model. Come on, I'm so happy, yeah, guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ready for it? We're ready for you. Great. Uh, I think I'm just going to put in the. Although, it looks like Ryan doesn't have a name tag. Uh, I'm leaving. Yeah. Years, and if you could, I know I just introduced you, but if you could reintroduce yourselves for the. Yeah. For our large viewing audience at home. Yes. Yes, I do. I don't really have a way to click through this. Um, Ryan, there's standing here. So, is there bag. one in the bag in the tech thing that Clicker? you just got? Yeah. No, that's a that's a. Uh, it must be somewhere else. Sorry, it's not in there. That's all right. You can just stand and look good, clicking away with your finger. Okay, are you, are you, is everyone okay with me being up here? Absolutely. Yes. All right. So, uh, so I, guess, I guess thank you very much for having us here tonight. We have been thinking a lot about this over the past year, and my name is Ryan Herity. I'm the principal of Union Elementary School, and uh, Mary Lundine, our director of student services, is is here. And so this year we're taking on an action research project around co-teaching. 
And when we started talking with Libby about this and, um, you know, kind of getting her blessing on everything and talking about what that was going to look like for our school this year, she thought it would be great if we could come to the board and just share with you what's happening in the school so you can get an idea of what's happening and just kind of find out, you know, what, what's, what we're doing. So this is about sharing that information with you. Great. So why co-teaching? And I'm not going to PowerPoint you to death. I, I can't stand when people do that to me. So I'm just going to kind of use this as a talking guide. But really, I want to tell you a quick story. So we were, I was um, in a classroom at the beginning of the year. And I was watching this teacher. And the teacher was doing just an incredible job. She had about 17 students in her class. And the students were completely engaged. It was a reading lesson. And the students were just eating out of the palm of her hand. And she was just, it was just one of those moments that you said, wow, this is just really terrific instruction. And then all of a sudden, there was a, a knock on the door. And a special educator came in the room. And the special educator took a student out of the classroom. That student left the room for 30 minutes and then re-entered the classroom again. That student was so engaged in the lesson and so invested in the learning, yet she was pulled out of the classroom to get the instruction that was a part of her IEP. And so when we saw that happen, we saw two major issues with that. One is you, know, you have a student that is taken out of the classroom that is you know, taken away from her peers, and you also are taking away this terrific momentum that she has with her learning. And then when she re-entered the classroom, she had a hard time trying to find out what everybody else was doing and to get back on track. And so at that moment, you know, it's, we can do better than this for our kids, and this doesn't really align with our values around inclusion or around supporting all of our students and making sure that they have access to really high quality instruction throughout their entire day. And so I had a lot of discussions with the special educators in the building. I met with them every Monday this year. And one of the first things that they communicated to me was that they felt that the effectiveness of the current special education model really could be improved. And they felt like they wanted to spend more time in classrooms. They loved to be in classrooms. And that was something that they just kept telling me over and over. And I said, well, you're on the same page with me because that has been my experience as an administrator is always pushing for a really inclusive environment. I have a lot of experience with co-teaching. I have a master's in special ed and I was a special ed teacher. I said, this is my jam. This is, you know, this is really what I want to do with, with our, co with our uh, special education model in the school. So we started having those conversations over the course of the year. And as I got to know the general ed teachers, I started having some of those conversations with them. And they were saying, we would really love for the special educators to be in our classroom more often. We would love to like co-teaching. We would love to be teaching together and not having our students pulled from the classroom. And so my question was, well, why hasn't, you know, why hasn't this happened? And they said, well, it's, we've never really been able to align this and, and make it work. And I said, well, let me talk to Mary about it and see if we can you know, start kind of dipping our toes in the water and seeing if it's a good fit. So, Really, we were looking for teacher support to really start this process, because without the teacher support and teachers saying, hey, this is something we really want to do, then we knew it wouldn't be a success. So I was looking at a situation where we had overwhelming teaching support to start code teaching and start really looking at our special ed model. So that's what we did. Um, so what does code teaching offer? It offers more opportunities for one-to-one -one interactions, access to grade level standards for our students, opportunities for specialized instruction. All students benefit from additional supports that we have in the building, increased independence, stronger, more creative lessons. Really, there's, there's so many benefits to a code top model. So currently, who's going to be involved at our school? When we first started having this discussion, it was maybe one or two grades. We didn't want to. I didn't want to push the teachers too hard on it. We didn't want to just go forward without having their support. And we had overwhelming support. Kindergarten, first, second, and third grade was all really excited about doing it. The fourth grade was also excited about doing it. But the teacher that was the most excited is going to be on a, a sabbatical this year. So it was kind of a situation where we said, you know what, let's start with K to three. We have that momentum. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, Uni University of Vermont. We met with them at the end of the year. Mary and I met with them and wanted to find out what support they could provide us. And so we started having discussions with them around a partnership this year. So they're going to be working with us. That was one of the biggest things teachers asked. What support are we going to get if we do this? And so we wanted to make sure that 
It wasn't just Mary and I, you know, providing professional development for them. It was someone that they felt, wow, this is something that we wouldn't otherwise have access to unless we decided to make this shift in our practice and really try something new. And so that UVM partnership is, is going to be really exciting. And then just our, our support as well. Um, so what work has been done around this? So we visited a school, the Ottaquichi School in Quichi, and I sent out, there's a listserv where you can basically send out a question to any principal in the state. And so I sent out a question and I said, has anybody had success with the co-teaching model where, we could, where I could talk with you? And I had a couple principals write back to me. One of them was the Ottaquichi School, and the principal was super nice, and she said, yep, I'd love to talk with you about it. We've had great success. And so we started, I, you know, started having discussions with her, and then we took a team of teachers down there. So we took a teacher from each grade, a special educator from each grade, and went down there and visited and spent the entire day talking with teachers, visiting classrooms, observing classrooms, um, uh, speaking with the principal, debriefing with everyone afterwards, and, and kind of learning from that experience. And then we've had a lot of curriculum development that's been happening in our building, as you have probably heard about. There's been a lot of work around math this year, and the summer there's been a lot of work around literacy, so we're finally in a really good place, starting to be in a good place around having curriculum documents and having a vertically aligned progression for our students. And then also we have a pre-approved plan by the AOE, which is something that you need and something that Mary has done in the past. Um, so support, I already talked about that a little bit. We have monthly training sessions with UVM. Uh, we have our support in coaching and our experience in this area. We have the curriculum documents that we're working on and also new math resources. And one of the biggest things that we're really excited about is, aside from our math resources, is our work with Christian Cordemash this year, who's our math consultant, and he's going to be working with us on the second in-service day, and he's going to be working with each grade level throughout the entire year. And it couldn't, it really isn't a better time to launch a co-teaching model because the special educators and the general ed teachers are going to be receiving high quality PD at the same time, talking about what is really great instruction for math. So that's, that's something that we're, we're excited about. Um, so how are we gonna find out at the end of the year if this was a success for our students? And that comes down to data. And so we're going to have literacy and math assessment data this year. In the district, we're implementing the STAR assessment, which you'll probably hear about more as we go through the year, but that's an adaptive assessment. Students take a computer-based assessment. It basically will increase in rigor if the students get questions right, and it will go down and become easier if the students get questions wrong. And basically, it gives you a kind of a screening tool to tell you, you know, where the students start the year, and it's a good just basic measure. And so we're going to use that as a, as a basic measure for us as we go through the year, in addition to our SBAC scores and benchmark assessments that we're going to be doing throughout the year. And if that's all jargon, any of that's jargon that you don't understand, I'm happy to kind of repeat and break it down, because this is stuff we just talk about all the time, and sometimes we just assume everybody knows what a, what a benchmark assessment is or something like that. Um, so feel free to to ask clarification on that. Yeah. Brian, yeah. could you explain a little bit more the difference between the STAR thing that you just described yeah. and the Fontes and Pinella that was already in use? Yeah, what are so, what yeah. Are the so, so the STAR assessment is a screener, and it's a computer-based assessment. So all, <laughs> all grades, and you know, we're a little um, leery on how kindergarten and first grade are going to do on a computer-based assessment. But for students in second, third, and fourth, we should be able to get a pretty quick gauge on where they're at when they enter the school year. And the Fontes and Pinnell assessment is a much more comprehensive assessment that has a lot more data measurement points that um, our teachers use for literacy only. And so this gives us a math gauge for all grade levels, and that's going to be a nice feature for us. A screener like STAR will give us a quick idea. It's a screener. It gives us a quick idea of about where a kid is reading so we, and, and, and performing in math and can give us a quick idea about potential holes they might have or gaps and potential places where they can excel, but not a whole lot of depth. You can't teach right off of it. Yeah. Whereas Fonses and Pinnell, a, kid, a teacher could give that with a kid and immediately have a week's worth of mini lessons for that kid planned off of that one assessment. Um, so it's a much more diagnostic measure and gives you more specific data about where a kid is reading. It's not math, though. It's just reading. 
And uh, the STAR also <coughs> has, there was a study done between STAR and SPAC to see if there was a correlation between that. And there's a really strong correlation between how students perform on STAR and how they perform on SPAC. So for us, if that's our state measurement tool and our, one of our public data points, then it's important for us to know, you know how, our, how our students are doing before we, you know, we take an assessment that's basically an autopsy. It's after the fact, after we've had, by the time we get the results back, it's basically an entire year of learning is already done. So with this tool, we can get a really good gauge right at the beginning of the year, starting earlier, as opposed to only third and fourth grade. So, um, also teacher and parent feedback is gonna be really important this year. And so we're gonna be making sure that we talk with families about what their experience has been, being in a co-taught classroom and talking with our students and also student work samples are gonna be really important, and our time studies, which I don't know if, Mary, you wanna kind of explain the time study piece. So um, what a time study is, it's, it's a requirement to look at the amount of time a special educator is spending on special education either services or responsibilities around paperwork. It's the way our current funding system works. And so what you do is you pick two weeks during the year. So typically we have to do it in October. And so everyone who is paid with special ed funds has to keep track of what they are doing from the time they come to school until the time they leave. And then we do that again for a week in February. And what we have to do is we look at those time studies and then we have to match them to student IEPs, to service pages, and look, is this person said they were working with this child from eight o'clock to nine o'clock on literacy? Is it in that child's IEP? If it's not, then it's disallowed. It's just the way the funding formula works right now, and you've probably heard about 173, Act 173, that's coming and, and it's been delayed um, until July 2021. That law, 173, is gonna provide us with more flexibility so that hopefully we're not gonna have to do these time studies anymore. So really, we will be able to use a special ed resource to support all struggling learners, whether it's an English language learner, a student who uh, just is a little behind and needs that extra support, so that'll provide us with flexibility. So it should, hopefully, fingers crossed, no more time studies. Um, but when Ryan and I were looking at them just for UES, and I said to him, you know, looking at what the special educators were doing, it wasn't an effective use of a resource. They're, they were just, kind of scattered all throughout the day in and out of classrooms and instead we really thought with the co-teaching they're going to be able to to reach more kids so that's the goal can you talk to how the time study affects kids not on an IEP that um, might or might not be in the group so so there is under special ed finance you can do what's called the small group rule <laughs> yeah. Sorry. The small group rule is what that means is that you can use a special educator or an instructional assistant that's paid with special ed money and and as long as the majority of the group are kids who have IEPs, you can pull other kids in, but the, but the thing is they have to be on a plan. So they would have to have either a 504 plan or an EST plan. And I know this is lots of acronyms and jargon, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but the bottom line is they would have to have some sort of plan. With 173, that's not going to be the case anymore. It, you don't have to have a plan. So if you're someone that really needs some extra help, there's that flexibility now with the new law that you can use a special educator. The other thing that'll be nice is you can use a reading specialist for a child who's on an IEP. It doesn't have to be a special educator delivering the reading service. So those are the things that we're really thinking about. Yeah, I, I just want to point out you can't, just because the child needs this instruction right here, 
and the special educators doing it, yeah. you can't just put them in that group for right. now. Right. And that's frustrating for a lot of teachers, but it's disallowed if we're not following the rule. So, um, so <laughs> with, with regard to this, um, in terms of the write-up, it mentioned that you know these these resources will be able to reach students um, who have a skill need uh, that don't have an IEP. Does that mean that they then have to have another type of plan to be in, incorporated in these groups? So, so no, not with the them? co teaching. So, okay. that what I was describing to you would have been more if the special educator was just pushing into a classroom for a specific group or pulling a group of kids out. So, what co teaching will do. So if Ryan and I are a co-teaching team, he's the general educator and I'm the special educator. And so we're looking at a phonics lesson, let's say. So Ryan really knows the grade level standards and he knows what, um, what the objectives are you know, for that lesson. What I'm going to do as the special educator is really think about all kids and some kids may learn auditorily instead of visually. Some kids might need more scaffolds put in place. And so together, we're going to have that conversation and talk about all the kids in the class and the supports that would be necessary for everybody to be able to access that lesson. Um, and then we're, we may do um, station teaching, where kids are actually rotating through and they get time with both of us for pieces of the lesson. And then we're, again, looking, like Brian said, we would be looking at the data together. We would be having conversations. Um, so what it's doing is it's pairing a general ed teacher and a special educator. The general ed teacher has the content knowledge. The special educator really understands learning differences. And so the two together should be able to reach all learners. And prior to Act 173 taking effect, under the co-teaching model, will we be able to use those special education dollars more flexibly? Um, no, yes and no. So because we have an approved plan mm -hmm. that I wrote, and so the agency has approved that, we are allowed to put co-teaching in IEPs, and okay. they will allow that now. Okay. If we didn't have a pre-approved plan, we would not be allowed to co-teach. But because of that AOE plan, yeah, so we would be okay, um, yeah, as long as we're still making sure that the needs of the child as outlined in the IEP are still being met, mm -hmm. so. So in the co-teaching model, if you did a time study, can it be by either the regular ed teacher or the special ed teacher? So the time study I, I don't do on regular ed. Um, it would just be on the special That's educator. Right. So what their time study would show is that they, if we're using, again, just kindergarten, it'll show the blocks of time that Andrea is in that class. And what we would put on the time study are the initials of kids that do have IEPs or plans so that they could see that all of those kids would have been serviced. But in addition, kids without plans also benefit. Yeah, Thanks. it's just, it's all of, and you've probably heard about all of the memos and the rules and everything coming out. It's, it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so just uh, one question on kind of the inclusion on kids who aren't on IEPs in some of these groups. Um, how are you going to be sure, one, that that's done relatively equitably from team to team? Um, and you know, kind of variances in how various teams might work together. And second, is there any um, any concern that that might actually draw from the kids on IEPs because you've got kids who aren't on IEPs who maybe like need the help but also might be more receptive to the help? So, mm -hmm. you know, are they, you know, maybe perhaps, you know, some kids are pushing ahead further and they might end up yeah. getting attention at the expense of kids who, who might yeah. need more individualized attention, but aren't getting it because now they're in a, a bigger group with kids who maybe are, you know, more facile learning. Yeah, I think um, both of those are come down to training, yeah. and so that was one of the big reasons that we wanted to go to the Quichi school, 
-hmm. because we had an opportunity to go in and see a lot of different classrooms. Some of those classrooms, it, that wasn't the model that we want. And the special educator in the room was acting more as a paraprofessional and wasn't really involved in the instruction, wasn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to, you know, in a really strong co-teaching classroom, you should walk in and not know who the special ed teacher is and who the general ed teacher is. You should just walk in and say, there's two teachers in this room, both doing a great job with kids. And that wasn't the case in some of those rooms. And when we debriefed with our teachers afterwards, you know, we said, hey, what'd you think about, you know, the different classrooms and what did you see? And all of our teachers were able to identify that and say, well, some of the classrooms weren't really co-teaching. Mm -hmm. They were acting more as, a, you know, an assistant in the classroom. So I think we're fortunate that we have really great teachers that understand that, and that's one of our biggest strengths. So we have to, I think that's, you know, we're starting in a really good place, and then it comes down to that training around showing what really high quality instruction looks like and looking at the data. So saying, you know, monitoring the progress of our students, not yeah. just once at the end of the year, but monitoring it, you know, at the end of October and saying, hey, how are our students doing? You know, are there students that aren't making progress here? And how are we changing our instruction to meet their needs? And so that piece we're, we're excited about. Yeah. yeah. So is, that, is the idea that each grade will have one co-taught classroom in the grade? Yeah. That's the plan? Yeah. Well, so all of the students on an IEP will be in that classroom? No. 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 So that was, and that's strategic, because um, that was one of the biggest misconceptions that teachers had around the model, is they said, okay, well, our classroom is going to be, you know, we're going to have this imbalance of student needs within our classroom, and they were concerned about that. And when we explained that, it was, no, it's going to be the right fit. So it's going to be the students that are going to do well and thrive in a co-talk classroom this year with the training and the resources that we have with the eventual goal to have all of our students in a co-talk classroom. So next year is just one classroom per grade, not all of them. Right. Right. We don't have the, uh, the students with IEP numbers to, uh, we don't have, it, the, the reason, another reason why this model works so well as a pilot for next year is because of the numbers of kids we have in each grade level and, and the types of disabilities that we see and um, it's all kind of the perfect puzzle time to do a pilot like this, so. Um, right, yeah. and, and the other thing that we talked about is really starting with kids who had mild to moderate disabilities being in the co-taught classroom and the kids with more significant disabilities would not be in that classroom because one of the things that we really want to work with UVM around is um, helping teachers to really understand how to work with students, classroom teachers, how to work with students who have significant um, learning challenges. So there's still a lot of work there about um, what does it mean for a student with a significant disability to be included, and it means more than just being physically present. So that's part of the work that we'll be doing with UVM, and it comes down to a training piece, um, as well as the work that we're doing as a district around the belief that all students will learn. So I think it all fits nicely together. Yeah, Ryan, real quick, you've had the list of metrics behind you for how you're going to measure success. Yeah. But what's the time frame? Like six months in, will you be able to declare whether or not things are working? Do you need two academic years? Kind of what, what kind of yeah. time frame? I mean, I think, I think realistically, uh, it's a multi-year, you know, to really look at data over time and see how, it, how the growth happens. I think this year, with our implementation of curriculum documents vertically that we haven't had, before, I think that by itself, we're going to see a pretty, I hope we're going to see a data bump from that. Um, so I think our data is probably going to reflect positively in a pretty short time frame, I hope, but, you know, I think it's multi-year. I think yeah. just one other thing about a, another big benefit of co-teaching is to really um, help kids develop independence so that they are not so reliant on an, an adult, which usually is a paraprofessional. So there, that's another benefit of co-teaching, and you really focus on that. Um, so that's exciting, too. Do we now have one special educator per grade? 
Yeah, uh, union, union we do, so Union, yes, and um, at Main Street they are assigned more to just the different teams at 7, 8, and then 5, 6 has a grade level, and then at the high school um, they just divvy up the caseload of high school. So, um, a second grade class that's going to be co-taught. We'll have that special educator for part of the day co-teaching, and then that special educator will um, be administering instruction to other students in the other classroom. Yes. Right. But the majority of their day will be spent in the co-taught classroom. Basically, right now, it's the entire literacy and math blocks that they're in the, yeah, in addition to morning meeting. Um, that's, I mean, that's, Basically, all the information that I have. Um, Great. Yeah. Do you have yeah. other other questions? Or? Great. Well, thank you so much. It's just um, we really appreciate it, and these these presentations are very helpful. They really give us context and give us a peek into what you're doing and what your needs are. Thank you very much. For Great. Thank you. Thanks for thank you. coming. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, so on to board business, uh, which I think is going to be pretty short and sweet. I also want to add, that would be like the shortest meeting ever. We <laughs> 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 were in light, <laughs> starting. Um, I, I want to add one more thing to the, the board business. Um, Bridget has a uh, continuing conflict on, um, on uh, Third Wednesdays. On third Wednesdays, uh, which apparently makes it possible for her to get to the high school relatively on time, but difficult for her to get to Roxbury on time. So, is there any uh, objections to shifting the Roxbury meeting, which always falls on a third Wednesday, to having it fall on a first Wednesday? You want to switch? To the a fourth Wednesday instead of the third Wednesday. First no, Wednesday. Just the way that it no, no, has I meant out. just that we would have a school board meeting on the first and the fourth instead of the first and the third. Because are you going to have a trouble anyway getting? No. Oh, okay. No, it's just it's another conflict in town that ends at usually around six twenty or so, yeah. but I can't get to Roxbury. So. And if we switch to fourth Wednesday, then we would be up to the city council. The city council. No, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. I was thinking, never mind. People watching real time for the second half of the second meeting. It's not every first. Right. So every Roxbury meeting is the fourth board meeting. Yeah. And that just happens to fall on a third Wednesday. It just happened to fall on a third Wednesday. It was on the third Wednesday. So, so it'll still say every fourth meeting, but um, but to the first. But yeah, shift it. So the next. So one basically, one we'll have to make sure. Once you switch on. once, you'll be in the rotation. Yeah, once you yeah. switch yeah. once, switch once, and keep the rotation. Okay. Like if the next Roxbury meeting was supposed to be the third Wednesday, so if we made it the first Wednesday, Wednesday. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, or the first right. Wednesday in okay. October. You know what? Anna and I will look at that tomorrow, and we will send everybody out a revised calendar. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time switching in these two months because. Um, the f next, are we going to UES on the beginning of September? And then we have our pictures on the second. I'll leave it to you. They'll work it. <laughs> well, we can do our, our pictures in Roxbury. Good. Yeah. yeah. You have the lady come there? Yeah. Uh, a picture at the Roxbury. Yeah. Good idea. Those cameras work in Roxbury too. Uh, <laughs> so um, not digital, they're as long as they're not connected to the internet. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so we will uh, move back appointing. Oh, except um, move back appointing Jerry uh, as clerk, uh, but 
since Michelle is circusing, this is a perfect time to appoint her to the Language Diversion Committee. She's already agreed and can't change her mind. Michelle is going to be on it? Yeah. All right. Well, I move that we appoint Michelle Brown to the Language Immersion Committee. You said she wanted to be. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Is, oh. it, when is that committee set to meet for the first time? It did meet once already. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then the final thing is the Main Street Middle School committee charge, um, which we have drafted. We can also, uh, we're looking for a second board member, and I know that the second board member is interested. Um, so we could probably make that appointment tonight as well uh, if that's we approve the charge. Um, I want to propose that one change that we discussed then to the charge as well. Yeah, if you could describe it. Um, do, you, do we want to appoint the person or should we start with the charge? Let's start with the charge. So, um, the, so town meeting day 2020 to produce a public facing report, I'm concerned is going to um, scrunch the timeline for public participation because we can't get on the city council's agenda to even talk with them about this, though I did talk with Anne Mayor Watson, um, and um, we talked about some city council members uh, that she thought would be um, very helpful to us on this, as well as thought would be willing to assist, but we won't be able to talk with them until the second Tuesday of September. So I'm thinking that this committee might not meet for the first time until October. And we might be able to do one month where we do two meetings, but if we're going to do public engagement and then we're going to get down to exploring these issues based on that public engagement, based on Andrew LaRosa's expertise, and based on our own research. I just think early March is going to be too scrunched a timeline. Um, I would love it if we can get it out in spring, but I think setting a date closer to the end of the, end of the school year, end of the fiscal year, would allow us to have a more meaningful public process. Yeah. What do you propose the change to be? What date would you pick? We can say produce a public facing report by the end of fiscal year 20, and my hope would be that it would be done, you know, like a month or so in advance of that, because I think it would be really helpful by the time we have our retreat next year. Uh, to be able to have a more meaningful conversation about this. This isn't, whatever comes out of this, isn't, this isn't going to be something that, you know, the community and the school board act on in a very, you know. Um, quick manner. Yeah, quick manner. I think it's something that, it's a discussion that's been percolating for years in this community, and what we're trying to do is really focus that discussion in a meaningful and solutions-oriented way. Right. No, I think it's a fine plan. We don't have a decision we have to make on a time frame, so a little bit of delay is fine with me. So, a motion to approve as amended. I'll make a motion to approve the Main Street Middle School Building Committee's charge as presented, changing the public facing report date to the end of FY20. And I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And now we might as well appoint this. Tina has expressed interest. Um, is anyone else interested in? Did we formally appoint Andrew already? No, we did formally appoint Andrew. <laughs> so he was oh, we did. We did. We did. We did. We did. The board asked you and I to come up with a proposal. Yeah. And with we the idea the that you would be chair. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure we did much. I don't think we formally appointed you. No. The charge here it has it listed yeah. as the chair, and yeah. we, can well, we could do it again anyway. It's yeah. not going to hurt. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So move that the board appoint Andrew Stein as the chair and Tina as the other school board member for the Main Street Middle School Building Committee. All second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. And then for the other, I just. Do you reach out and then when you've got your whole list, just bring it to the board and have the whole list approved. Yeah. And I'm definitely happy to help brainstorm moving on. 
Yeah, that would be great. Well, it would probably make sense to meet with Andrew LaRosa in advance as well. Maybe Libby and Andrew. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, I think we can have a motion to adjourn. So we'll also make a motion to adjourn. You motion to adjourn or you move to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Uh, I second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Great. Isn't that, did you add that to consent? Um, you didn't formally um, add that. I don't think I formally added that. Well, come back into session. <laughs> um, re entering session <laughs> at 7 19. Um, just to make sure we are kosher. Anyone in the public comment now? No. Uh, oh. right. uh, so I think we are a smooth operating yes. machine. Uh, <laughs> we okay. could pass things separately. Move to approve the three yes. teaching position appointments and the co-curricular recommendations um, that were added to the agenda. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, no, give me a second, give me a second. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Okay, now the second is adjourned.